to this edition of the Angels and Destiny show. Why is this show called this show, may I ask? So I'll tell you. The accepted meaning of angel is messenger, and the accepted meaning of destiny is to make firm establish. So my guests and I bring you messages to establish what you need to know in the present. And also, I like working with angels and the calmness they bring. Now, in a moment, I will introduce you to my wonderful guest, Karen Ascarali. But before that, I'd like to say thank you so much for, your con- for watching this show live at a later date, as it means a lot to me to connect with like-minded women. Now, if you've never met before, then my name is Ray, and I love to help women to crossroads in their life, heal their past, create their future, and transform their present, so they can take charge of their destiny in the here and now. I'm the founder of Radiant Angel Energy, and I use future life progression, past life regression, angelic reiki, guided meditation, angel oracle cards, and hypnosis to help women who feel lost get re- clear on their reason for being here. And I've also created several transformational jerk packages to help you take charge of your destiny. So do please check them out. Now, each episode of the show covers various themes of your journey, a mini guided meditation or angel oracle card reading with the wisdom of my wonderful guests, like today's guest, Karen Ascarali, about how when we feel we have lost a sense of self or purpose, we can use writing to help heal and find our true purpose. Now, Karen is an educator, author of four inspirational books, an inspirational speaker, a local radio show host, a book mentor, where that means helping others take their books from abstract to actual, um, an editor, ghostwriter, and publisher. Now, she's also an avid runner, the mother of one adult son, and is currently working on her fifth book. Now, after sustaining life-threatening gunshot uh, wounds during the attempted robbery in 2013, the former chemistry teacher for over 20 years was left broken physically, emotionally, and financially. So Karen set about redefining herself um, after having to retire on medical grounds at the age of 47 as a result of the incident. Now, Karen advocates for peace against violence through her not-for-profit Project Rare, which is raising awareness on the ripple effect of gun violence. She uses storytelling and reflective writing as tools for helping others build resilience. And in 2018, she was one of 20 BBC Outlook Inspirations, a recognition program for persons who have achieved in spite of adversity. She was also awarded the Amway's Heroes Award for Determination in 2019 in Dallas, Texas. Now, Karen is going to share with us a story of overcoming using 10 plus one key steps that are collectively called Game Shifter and how she's working with others to help them heal through writing. So without further delay, hello, Karen, and welcome to the Angels and Destiny show. How are you today? Hello, Ray. I am doing very well today and thank you for having me on your show. It's Uh, wonderful to be here. Brilliant. Thank you for coming on. So before we get into this fascinating conversation, I want to remind you that not only can you share this video, but you can also ask questions, leave comments and thoughts, as both Karen and I want to be part of this conversation. So please do not be shy. So Karen, why don't you tell us more about your journey and how we can shift into purpose using writing? So my journey is maybe not the most common journey, but there are elements in my journey that anyone can relate to because it's really trauma related when you look at it. So my journey started off quite simply, quite on the average. I was a chemistry teacher at public secondary schools for 22 years before I had a major disruption in my life. So, you know, life has this way of just throwing us off course at times. Uh, what What's important is that, you know, we can get over or get around those obstacles that life may throw at us and be able to move forward. So in my case, what happened back on Tuesday, the 29th of January, 2013, is that um, my car, I I was out that evening and someone else was driving my car. My car was surrounded by uh, bandits. I'm not sure how many there were, but I'm sure of two. I'm certain about two. And... um, it all happened very quickly, Ray, to be quite honest with you. And it unfolded something like what you would see in a movie. It was it was unbelievable in the sense that I recognized immediately that something was going to happen and I shifted. Now, had I not shifted, what uh, could have happened based on what the police told me after is that the, 
they were probably aiming for the driver so that they could take the car. That was the modus operandi of that group of bandits. And um, that night I shifted and I took the bullet instead of the driver. So when we when the driver realized what was happening, he immediately sped off. But what had happened was that I was shot and I took the bullet on my chin, my chest and my shoulders. So I was shot in three places. And you know, I'm always amazed when I think back about seeing that car several weeks later, all of the shrapnel, all of the blood, everything was contained right in the area where I was seated. You know, you would expect to find something on the other side of the car. There was nothing. It was all within my area. I mean, I'm telling you that now because it's really striking me and I never really dwelled on it too much except for this morning. So I'm thinking maybe there's something behind it. But anyway, <laughs> what happened was that um, this part of my chin was completely blown off and it was actually hanging by a thread. By the time I got to the hospital, which was about 10 minutes away, and I didn't even get there by an ambulance. What happened was the driver was taking me, saw a police car, stopped the police car, transferred me to the police vehicle, and I was taken by a police vehicle to the hospital. Um, by the time I got there, I had lost a lot, a lot of blood. And of course, um, I can't even begin to tell you the myriad of thoughts that entered my mind while I was being transferred. And somehow I knew that I had to survive. I knew it was all about fighting for my life at that point. And um, I stayed very quiet. In fact, the police thought I had passed somewhere along the journey because they actually slowed down uh, in the last five minutes getting to the hospital. They were just cruising along and I was there. I couldn't see anything because I couldn't talk and uh, wondering what's going on. And then I started to worry, started to worry about what my family would think, what my students, how they would manage, because my students were going to be writing exams in six months' time. Now, so for me, um, I could just go on and on. You can ask me questions if you want, but I'm going to kind of short circuit the story because I could just go on all day with yeah. it. So yeah. <laughs> when I got to the hospital, um, what what eventually was the outcome was that they had to remove the that piece of my jaw. Uh, my lower jaw was fractured on both sides all the way up to my ear. My tongue was macerated and was slipping down into my throat, threatening to strangle me. And, um, you know, there was just shrapnel all over my chest, my, my shoulder. It was all damaged. Fortunately, they were able to perform whatever emergency, emergency surgery they had to do, remove all shrapnel as much as they could and um, when I got up the next morning I was in ICU and um, connected to so many different things and they even had to create a, 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 an extra space right here to put in what's called a tracheostomy to ensure that the tongue didn't get in the way of my healing and that I could breathe properly. Eventually, uh, what happened was that whereas I was given an entire year to stay at the hospital and six months in ICU, it turned out that I just stayed three days in ICU and one month at the hospital because my healing was that quick. Yeah, it was amazing. And uh, yeah, I don't know what, I just give thanks and praise. And um, for, for the first three weeks, I was unable to speak completely, couldn't talk, no voice at all. Uh, it wasn't just fear it was a physical thing i just could not speak and um you know it was that was really a humbling experience because there was a the hospital unable to say anything to anybody with all these tubes hanging all over and all these people visiting and seeing me looking like this and you know i, I was really vain before but you know you you'd like to you like to fix yeah. yourself before you and I had that encounter the first time we met, you know. You like to fix yourself properly before you yeah. meet people. And here I was just, this is how they're seeing me. I, I had no idea what, what they were seeing. So, you know, it was humbling on many levels. That's just one of the levels. But it was also humbling because I couldn't eat. There was nothing I could eat. 
because remember there was this hole here so what i had yeah. was a nasogastric tube yeah. that went straight down to the stomach and um that was my sustenance for that month and after that um my jaws had to be wide shut now that was something that should have been almost right away didn't happen so my jaws started collapsing inwardly while it was healing so when they eventually rewired when they eventually wired the jaw they had to break it once again before rewiring it so the jaw was broken a second time and then rewired and um eventually i was told i had to do reconstructive and plastic surgery i'll just tell you very briefly that i had to break the jaw three times oh, and no. rewire before i actually, yeah, <laughs> before i actually underwent reconstructive and plastic surgery and of course all of that took about nine months and for those nine months i had no solid food i lived on liquid so i lost a lot of weight which some people might be happy for but you know um, the way that it happened is not a nice way <laughs> and um, yeah it's not nice i wouldn't wish it on anybody not even my worst enemy and um yeah so i was a shadow of myself now for those first nine months what i did was i focused on the physical healing so i focused on organizing things for surgery getting the money together because i lost a lot in the process. Um, the surgery, while the treatment at hospital was free because we have free public uh, healthcare system here, um, the surgery had to be done privately because our hospitals weren't equipped to do part of the surgery. So it meant that I had to pay for that. So all of my life savings went into surgery. I had to sell my car as well to ensure I had sufficient funds. So I had, I suffered tremendous losses. And as a teacher in a public secondary school, when you stay away for a certain length of time, even if you submit medicals, what happens is that you, for the first three months, you will receive your full salary. For the next three months, you'll get half your salary. And after that, you get nothing. And once you stay away for a year, then they call you in and assess you for medical payment uh, on medical grounds. So I went through all of that. I eventually had to retire from teaching. Now, bear in mind, I had been a teacher for 21 or 22 years at that point. So I was 47 years old. I um, had been a teacher all, all my adult life. And now here I was left without my savings with a broken, damaged face, unable to speak properly because I got a lisp out of it, um, unable to do so many things. And now I wasn't able to teach without friends. I lost friends along the way because fa let's face it, um, I, I, don't, I don't hold it against them because everybody has issues in their lives. And I mean, yes, they were there with me up to a point, but then life has to go on. Yeah. So um, I was left in a pretty depleted state in all senses. So um, at that point, nine months after the incident, that was when I was actually now literally just sitting back and trying to heal. And then that's when all these thoughts hit me and I realized what had really happened and the impact it was going to have on my life. And I started to slip into depression uh, I didn't realize at first what was happening. So, you know, the usual things, uh, withdrawal, sleeping too much, not sleeping, nightmares, flashbacks, all those sorts of things. And um, one day I realized it was getting out of hand because I was in the car with someone, with my mom, and um, I suddenly wanted to scream out aloud. I didn't do it, but I wanted to. And it was at that point I realized, okay, something is going on. I need some professional help. And, you know, I, I want to stress that this is one of the things um, that's really important because in addition for, to advocating for peace and against violence, I also advocate for mental health issues. And, you know, I just want to stress that it's very important that we do seek professional help. You don't always need it, but there are times when we do need it and we need to recognize that and there's nothing wrong with doing it it doesn't make you weaker in fact i think it makes you a stronger person to recognize that you need help and to reach out for it so that point was yeah. when i realized you know 
it was going in the wrong direction. I sought help. I got help. Yeah, Ray, really, I got help um, both medically and in terms of counseling. Yeah. And uh, those two things helped. And then I got up one morning, uh, suddenly inspired. <laughs> That's the only word I could use, inspired, because I recognized at several different levels that, you know, things couldn't continue this way. And I needed to get up and get. But I also had this story inside of me that I needed to get out. And um, where that came from was when I couldn't speak, I used to write. So I used to be writing to everybody at hospital to communicate. And then when, well, I am a praying person. So um, there were times I wanted to pray out aloud and I couldn't do it. So I would write it down. And then when I got out of the hospital, before I went for professional help, I started writing my story down just so I would remember certain things. I didn't want to forget. I mean, I wanted to move past it, but I wanted to bear in mind that this awful thing had happened to me. And um, I, there were details that I felt were important at that point in time. But what I wrote was just a story, really. And I felt that, you know, for somebody else reading it, what were they going to get from it? Now, remember, I'm an educator. So yeah. I always feel that you should, yeah, you should get some benefits and value from something that you're doing. So um, in January of the following year, I sat down and I read the story. And in a week and a half, I had my first book ready, first draft of my first book ready. Yeah. Now, that that's the only time it happened so quickly in the five books. That's the only time it happened so quickly. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, because there's a process in writing, I, I think. And there's also a process as far as editing goes. So even though I got it done in that first week and a half, it took a longer time. It's not a linear process. Um, so I read the book and this time I did it. I told the story in a different way. So it wasn't told chronologically the way things unfolded but it was told in a way that promoted lessons from the book so um you know i was able to to share on so many different levels the different things that happened what i had learned. and i felt that was important because we can't allow we can't have things so drastic happen in our lives and one we don't learn from it and two, if we do learn from it, that we don't share what we learn with others so that they too can benefit, that they wouldn't have to go through exactly what you went through. Maybe their process might be made easier because of your experiences. And so that's what that first book was about. And, um, you know, typical first time author thinking, oh yes, it's going to be a bestseller. <laughs> it didn't happen. It didn't happen, but that's okay, because I was able to get my message out. Um, prior to the incident, I was a very, um, very shy person, very shy. You would never get me to do any kind of public speaking. And now with this book, I had to promote my book. <laughs> I don't know where it came from, but I was able to get on a lot of um, almost every local television station. And... Um, every local newspaper and several of our radio stations as well and um i would say that you know we always hear about practice makes perfect and it's true i'm not perfect i didn't get perfect i'm still way far way away from um being perfect but i have come a long way and that only came with you know repeatedly doing things the same thing the same type of thing so with that first book i um I was able to reach a whole lot of different people. I got invited to speak at different um, events and share the lessons I learned in terms of um, adversity and how to overcome it. And I always stress to people that, you know, my circumstances are not yours, right? We are each given a, a customized life with customized obstacles, but we can take the lessons from one type of experience and transfer it to another if we are wise enough in what we are doing. So that's that's the angle from which I, I handle that. And um, within the next two years or three years, 
I published my other books. So I worked on a prayer book after that, but I only kept that locally. Um, I just did like 100 copies, gave it out as Christmas gifts and so on. Yeah. And then the second book, that the third book was Bounce Back Better. No, I didn't tell you the name of the first book. It was From Lion to Lamb, A Spiritual Journey. And <laughs> that title was significant because um, even though I was an introvert and shy before the incident, I could have been a lion. <laughs> if you step on my toes, I had a bad temper. <laughs> Let's put it, that's putting it mildly. And, you know, uh, my, oh, I, I could. I, yeah, I suppose we ought to clear up. I mean, whereabouts are you? Because people are thinking bandits. <laughs> Pardon me? Sorry. I didn't get that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so um, uh, to let our viewers know, where, whereabouts you're from, what country you're actually, all this happened oh, in. I am from, you know, I, I thought about it when we did the introduction and then it slipped my mind. So I'm, I'm in the West Indies. I'm from Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And I'm from the southern part of the island. Um, it, I'm from the, the second largest town, uh, city, which is called San Fernando. So, um, so going back a bit, uh, so from there, uh, I came up with a third book and this third book now, this is after reflecting after three years or two years, I started reflecting on what had happened, you know, how was it that I moved from being a reticent, a quiet, um, introverted, very shy, not outgoing chemistry teacher to becoming now an author, somebody who has to go and speak on public pa platforms and to do it, you know, in a, in a way that is uh, manageable. And I recognize also that, you know, at some point in time, I went through a grief process, grieving for what had happened, grieving for who I used to be and what I used to look like and what I stood for. And I realized that, you know, at one point, I didn't even know who I was. Yes, I was Karen Asgarali, but who was Karen Asgarali? I had been a teacher all my life. And then suddenly I was not. I just got up one morning, no school to go to, just lying down in bed, waiting. And that was when, you know, when I reflected, I realized, look, I've come a long way. I really find myself. I'm now this author. I was an uh, inspirational speaker also at that time. And... Um, you know, I'd come a long way. And so that gave birth to the third book, Bounce Back Better, 10 plus one key steps for building resilience. So that is where the game shifter came in. Because what I did was I sat down and I thought, okay, what were some of the things that helped me? And I came up with 10 things. And it was only the final edit and I, 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 it hit me. But you left out a key thing. The key thing was reflecting. If I didn't reflect, you know, I would not have been able to look at those things that had happened and make meaning out of them and help me to change my own narrative. So that's how I put it as 10 plus one. I wanted it clear that it wasn't just 11 steps. It was this plus one that came right. in afterwards. Now, after I wrote the book and I was going through it one night, I was listening to... Um, I can't even remember who it is, but there was somebody I was listening to, a podcast I was listening to, and I realized, okay, maybe I should come up with some kind of acronym. So I started to put the chapters down in order. And when I put them in order and I looked at the first letter, I'm not kidding you, it came up to Game Shifter. It did. And that to me was a powerful, powerful thing because it, it to me is better than what, I mean, want to compare I shouldn't say better but it's different than a game changer to me game changer tells you okay you flick a switch and things just happen but with a game shifter what you're doing is you are shifting from one place into another with gradual changes small changes for great success and so that's where the game shifter came in. And I'll just be very brief because I know we, we have limited time. Oh, <laughs> I'm no, looking at the right. time there. I don't know that. That's <laughs> right. It's my show. We can go on as long as I like. <laughs> so the game shifter, the G stands for goal setting. A is for acceptance and grieving. M is for moment by moment living. 
And I just want to share on that one a little bit because that was a critical one for me. I remember my my elder brother who is, he took, he's like a father figure because my father passed away. And he um he came one day at the hospital and he they always thought of me as a negative sort of person, you know, being so introverted unto myself. And then here I was exposed to everybody in this vulnerable position. And his concern was how was I coping mentally? on this bed unable to do very much and he came close to my end he whispered so what are you thinking about and you know when i look back at it i just had to laugh because i wrote on the paper i'm just thinking about when you all leave here uh how i'm trying to organize mentally how i'm going to get together my towel my toothbrush all my accessories to try to make it to the washroom before anybody else gets there and i think as simple as that sounds that's something that you know you can learn from we can take away something from that it's about you know setting goals yes and knowing you have these lofty goals that you want to achieve that are measurable achievable all the good things realistic but accepting that when something happens to derail you from your journey that you have to pause you have to live in the moment and just take that moment for what it is before you can begin to move forward again if you don't take that time then chances are um yes you may move forward but how you know you want to move forward positively in a different way you want what had happened to have meaning and value and you know i'll say that a few times because to me that's an important thing so goal setting acceptance and grieving moment by moment living e was for exercise and all things physical so exercise rest hydration all those things um then s is support a big part of anything that we are doing is support and you, know, you might not believe me but it took that incident at the age of 47 years for me to recognize that I was not an entity of my on, on my own. I couldn't exist on my own, which is what I had tried to do for most of my life. I had to turn to others for support. And I'm thankful that there were others I could turn to. And those others were my family members, my mother and my two brothers, my son. Those were critical people. So that's S for support. And then we got to H. Now, I want to pause by H a little bit. Um, not everybody will agree with me on this one. But, you know, I have to speak my truth, what I believe in. So there's G-A-M-E-S, right? There's G-A-M-E-S, five letters. And then there's H. And then there's I-F-T-E-R, five more letters. So H is smack in the middle of Game Shifter. And H stands for honoring God. Now, not everybody will use the term God, but it is that higher entity, right, that you um, subscribe to, that you believe in, that you hold on to, that you have faith in. Uh, for me, I, I refer as God. And yeah. I found it was surreal that smack in the middle of everything was each so you know one of my principles now um it was before but i didn't take it seriously is that whatever we are doing that should always be at the center of what we are doing so that was each and then i went to i which is i after you you know we always say i before you but it's i after you which refers to humility and then there's f for forgiveness there is T for training the brain, lifelong learning. E for embracing giving or philanthropy. And then there is R. And R, of course, is for reflecting. Yeah. So we must make that time for reflecting. So that's what the game shifter is about. And um, that's one of the things that I share with people, right? And in how you can shift from where you are to where you want to be and how you can begin to recognize what your purpose is because until you start being of service and sharing with others 
you really don't discover what your purpose is. You cannot stay by yourself, as I said, and discover that purpose. So it's like what you're doing. Your purpose is to meet so many different people and share all these different stories, right? But you would not have gotten there if you tried to do it on your own. Definitely. So um, definitely not, yeah. And you know, um, so that's that book. And then from there, my next step was, you know, I over the years, I just kept writing. I kept writing for different reasons. There were many things I write. I wrote just for myself. I didn't always write to share. And um, the writing became very important. And when I recognized, I realized that there was an actual program called Writing to Heal. Uh, unfortunately, because of my financial circumstances at that time, because of the incident, I was unable to access the actual training. But what I did was I bought all the books that I could find on writing to heal. And I read and I read and I read and I taught myself and I kept practicing and using it. And in 2018, 2019, I, um, Started a new book, Hot Cocoa on a Rainy Day, 10 plus 1 Stories to Warm Your Heart. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. It really is to warm your heart. And um, I enlisted the help of nine other Trinidadian authors. Um, and we together put together, each one of them shared their story, their inspiring story. And I wrote two extra stories based on two different people because I'd, I had already written my story. Yeah. And um, so that was a compilation, beautiful, well, very nicely done book. And then I shifted into um, focusing on helping people, something that I had started back in 2017 when I launched my not-for-profit Project Rare, raising awareness on the real effect of gun violence and you know um i just want to share with you a, a little quotation this was what inspired me to start advocating against violence of all forms but particularly gun violence yeah. and to advocate for peace so um of course it started out of a desire to stop the hurt and the pain and the emptiness that is left by even one act of gun violence and that inspiration, it is a quotation by a former vic by a victim, uh, not me, somebody else. I don't even know who it is, but it goes like this. With a single bullet, lives change, people change, financial situations change, social circles change. And there's this whole middle place that a lot of people are left in. And that middle place can be filled with rage, confusion, depression, anxiety, despair, and a need for revenge. So, you know, as a victim of gun violence, I am um, intimately familiar with that middle place where you feel anger, you feel the need for revenge, you feel all those negative feelings. But because of... Um, my belief in something greater than myself, I drew my strength and my peace from that. And it was what gave me the courage to forgive the people who had done this to me. And that forgiveness came even while I was at hospital. And I believe that's a great part. It played a massive part in being able to heal. I think as long as you hold on to negativity, you hold on to, um, things that prevent you from healing. So, you know, that is what gave me my, my, my faith, my belief is what gave me the perseverance to go through that difficult and painful incident, but to emerge with hope. And not just with hope for myself, but hope for others. So my whole focus now has been transforming hurt into hope. So what I did earlier, what I had done a couple of years ago, as I started the Writing to Heal program online, and you know, um, I advertised it. At first, I was doing it and charging a small fee. And I'll tell you something, Ray. People needed it, but people weren't willing to pay for it. And I just dis discontinued it for a while. 
And earlier this year, as a result of all the things that have been happening with the pandemic, and here in Trinidad, we have been in lockdown for a long time. I mean, it's quarantine, lockdown. It's, it has been difficult for us, extremely difficult. And um, I saw it with young students because I still do teach students just privately now. I don't do it in public schools and very small classes online now. And um, I decided I was going to offer this writing to heal to people for free. So what it meant, it's a six week program. So it's one hour every Saturday for six weeks. Um, I didn't see it as me losing anything. I saw it as me being able to help people. So even though I was doing it without charging, you know, there was so much benefit to be gained from it. And um, since I started that earlier this year, I've been doing it back to back. Every six weeks I start a new program and the beauty in it is that um, I've helped people, and I know I have, not because I'm vain or feel that I could do so much, but because they, of the feedback that I receive. And there are people who want to keep joining. They want to come back. So they've done it once. I mean, it's pretty much the same thing we do. <laughs> but they want to come back still. And um, I, I'm so happy that in the last, this current cycle, I have two gentlemen, you know, initially it was just women joining and I, I yeah. had resigned myself to that. I said, great, I'm focusing on women. That's my target audience. And then all of a sudden these two gentlemen joined in and they are benefiting, they are contributing, they are writing and they are sharing their writings. And it's, it's really a journey. And um, so they have benefited. But you know, Ray, I always say this, when you help others, you help yourself. And that's one of the things that helped me back in 2013. In the midst of all my troubles, what I did for that Christmas, remember it happened to me in January, but by Christmas, I um, organized to donate. By that time, I wasn't even getting my salary, but I organized to donate three sets of hampers to needy uh, families. I didn't want to go to them. I didn't want them to know who I was. I didn't yeah. want to know who they were. So I organized it, I passed it on to the same, um, the psychological, the psychiatric unit attached to our public hospital, and they passed it on to the families. And I think that must have been the breaking point for me because it was within a week or two after that, that I, I started writing my first book. Yeah. And when I started this Writing to Heal program, I benefited a lot in the sense that one, I believed in it, but now here people were believing not just in the program, but they were believing in the way that I was presenting the program to them. It was helping them. And so, you know, it built my confidence. And that's something that all of us need, you know, sometimes all of us need some reassurance, but some of us, some of us have too much. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know... <laughs> Sometimes we need it reminding that we do have something that we can offer to others. And um, I was able to, as the weeks went by, I was able to tweak the program. I keep making changes. And this last session has been so powerful. I mean, like one of the students afterwards, she had to, she felt compelled to call me, contact me outside of the class session setting to discuss just what was happening. She said, Miss, you realize that we went, and they call me Miss, and these are adults. We are not a formal, but they call me Miss. <laughs> oh, bless. <laughs> now that I asked them to, uh, I asked them to say Karen, but uh, I don't know. Uh, so it, um, she was saying, Miss, we have moved to, a this is one person who, who did it with me in a prior session, a prior cycle. This is a second cycle, and she said, Miss, you have moved it to a different level altogether. So um, I think you all have um, O level, ordinary levels, and advanced level education across the right secondary schools. So um, yeah. she's saying to me, I've moved it from the ordinary level to the advanced level. So I mean, just hearing that, it just gave me, you know, such a good feeling inside. So you know. Um, I want to share with your listeners that things can happen, bad things can happen. 
but you can take the lessons you can take the everything from it sift it out strain it out separate a good i should say filter it because i'm a chemistry teacher filter it take the residue that are the negative things right wrap it up in the filter paper and discard it but keep the filtrate of positivity all the good things from it right and use those things now to find who you are to shift into your purpose using the 10 plus 1 steps that i shared with you and using writing or whatever works for you perhaps writing might not work for you but as i always say writing is just one of the tools in your resilience toolkit yeah so maybe for you it might be creating art maybe for somebody else it might be cooking whatever it is you take that and you use that to help you find your purpose. But how do you do it? You find your purpose by focusing on helping other people, being of service to others. And that's my story condensed in a nutshell. There's so many other things we could talk about, <laughs> but you know, time yeah. doesn't permit. Um, I <laughs> yeah I, I mean i mean what you've shared anyway is is so amazing the fact that you've you've come back from from you know from from, from that darkness really for, for something that could really technically have taken you out com taken you out completely and it, you kind of like think that okay this was god the universe source etc saying okay we've got a job for you to do. We're going to, um, you know, hard as it may seem, we're going to actually cause you a bit of issue because we want you to actually do this, this role for us. And you need to have those experiences to, 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 actu to actually do it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you know, it's while you were talking every now and again, I was getting these little shivers, um, uh, you know, down, my, down, down, down my spine that, you know, you, you were guided really to actually where you are now, being able to help other people actually not just find their life purpose, but actually to heal um, from, yes. from stuff that's in the past. You know, it, it's, it's, it's such an amazing journey and story. Well, thank you so much for seeing that, Re. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, um, so, it's 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 yeah, it's it's, it's absolutely absolutely amazing, you know. Um, just that that one that one shift that you did in that car that day. Mm -hmm. Completely, completely. It's all started with one shift, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, in bounce back better, I mentioned um, at the beginning in the introduction, I spoke about you know the leaning tower of Pisa. Remember, they started off at the base with just a, a little inch or part of an inch off, but it translated into feet off as the tower went higher and higher. So, you know, never underestimate the power of one simple shift. Never underestimate that. Absolutely, per yeah. absolutely perfect. So, as you know, I do um, guide meditations, angel oracle cards, and each week I like to ask my guests what they would like me to do for themselves and those watching. So, Karen, mm -hmm. would you like me to do a mini guide meditation or would you like me to pull in an, an oracle card for you and those watching? I think I'd like to do the guided meditation, please. Okay, that's absolutely fine. So, what I want you to do is, and everyone watching, is just close your eyes. And as you do so, take a deep breath in and on the out breath, just release everything that doesn't need to be in this space. Take another deep breath in and on the out breath, just release everything that doesn't need to be here. And as you do, just allow your breathing to fall into its natural rhythm. Every in breath relaxing you more and more and every out breath just releasing everything that doesn't need to be in this space. And I want you now to think about relaxing. Think about relaxing your whole body from the top of your head to the tips of your toes, all the way down your arms to your fingertips. But when you think about relaxing, so you will relax. Allow yourself to relax. 
And as you do, I want you to see, fully imagine or know a beautiful golden light at the top of your head. And as this beautiful golden light moves down into your aura, you feel a sense of peace and relaxation around you. And just allow this golden light to move into your head and as it does, you feel the whole of your head start to relax. Your temples, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, your jaw. So relaxed. And just allow this relaxation to move down into your neck, down into your shoulders, and your shoulder muscles just starting to relax as this relaxation moves down into your upper arms, your elbows, your lower arms, your wrists, your hands and your fingers. And now this relaxation moves into your upper body and you feel all your chest muscles start to relax, your stomach muscles, the whole of your back relaxing as this relaxation moves down into your hips, your pelvis, your buttocks, down into your thighs, your knees, your shins, your calves, your ankles, your heels, your feet and your toes. And your whole body is just so relaxed. And I want you now to engage your imagination and imagine that you are standing outside a beautiful house, a beautiful mansion at the top of five steps leading down to a sunken garden. And you're going to walk down those steps from five to one, each descending number relaxing you more and more. So start walking down those stairs, five, going deeper down the stairs, four, deeper down the stairs, three, deeper down the stairs, two, more and more relaxed, deeper down the stairs, one. And you take a step off and you find yourself in a beautiful sunken garden. The sun is beaming down, warming your skin. The sky is a beautiful blue and there might be the odd white wispy cloud just going across and there's a gentle breeze just cooling your skin and you notice all the beautiful flowers around you in this garden, beautiful flowers of many colours and many scents. And you may even notice butterflies or bees or birds in this sunken garden. And as you walk through this garden, you notice that there's a beautiful water feature, a beautiful fountain of water, just cascading up, flowing into a beautiful pool. And as you watch it, you notice the sun catches the droplets of the water, forming beautiful rainbows, beautiful rainbow colours. And each drop of water just seems like a beautiful crystal, beautiful crystal of colour. And as you watch these crystal droplets of water, you realize that they are rainbow blessings, rainbow blessings that are sharing your life now. You, for, you forget the past, you forget the future, you are just in this moment at this time, thinking, knowing that you are being blessed you are being showered by beautiful rainbow blessings. Your life is so blessed. Allow that feeling to fill you up. Those rainbow blessings, that rainbow color filling you. How wonderful it feels 
to know that your life is being showered with beautiful blessings, knowing that you can be of service, that you are of service to others, and more and more blessings come to you. And just sit with that energy for a moment, enjoying those colors, that feeling. And now, just walk back through the sunken garden, back towards those five steps. And in a moment, I'm going to count you up the stairs from one to five, each ascending number bringing you back into the present, bringing back those rainbow blessings that are completely sharing your life. So coming up the stairs now, one, coming further up the stairs two, further up the stairs three, coming back into the present, further up the stairs four, all the way to the top of the stairs five, fully back, fully present. If need be, wiggle, wiggle fingers and toes, move your body, open your eyes, and welcome back. Ah, that was really relaxing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ah, you're welcome. And whilst we were doing that, I actually was uh, guided to uh, pull an oracle card as well, which actually <laughs> ended up forming the basis of our guide meditation. So for you and for everyone watching, rainbow blessings, blessings of sharing your life. Oh, nice. <laughs> How perfect Thank is that card? That and is perfect. Yes. Yeah, it is. It, Rainbow blessings. Yeah, absolutely. Seven colors, the diversity, so much, cover so many different things. <laughs> absolutely, abs absolutely. So again, for you and those watching, you know, there are rainbow blessings coming in when you when you can actually see the, the actual positive that there is in life and the beautiful colors that are all around us um, when, when they happen. So yeah, I, I, I really love that card. So, Karen, do you have any final um, insights or thoughts to leave our viewers? Well, there is one thing I would like to leave everyone with, and it's um, it's a quotation. So it's not my words, but it very nicely sums up everything that I could possibly see. So, you know, why reinvent the wheel? <laughs> so it, <laughs> it's a quotation that I use from Viktor Frankl who is a Holocaust survivor, among other things. And he said, well, I mean, he went through a lot of trials. What I went through is nothing compared to what he went through. And he said that everything can be taken away from a man, but one thing. And everything can be taken away from a man, but the last of the human freedoms, the ability to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's way. And to me, that's so powerful because things happen and anything can happen, but the power lies within you through the power of choice, choosing the right attitude to help you shift from that negativity into positive purpose. So thank you very much, Re. I appreciated this a lot. Ah, oh, that's brilliant. That's a wonderful um, quotation. And thank you so much for, for coming and sharing your story. So I hope everyone that you've enjoyed this conversation and found it insightful because I definitely know I have. So Karen, if people want to connect with you, how do they do that? And how would they find your books? So my books are on amazon.com and um, on Amazon. It's um, From Lion to Lamb, A Spiritual Journey. That's one, that's the first one. The second one is Bounce Back Better, 10 plus one key steps for building resilience. And the third one is Hot Cocoa on a Rainy Day, 
10 plus 1 stories to warm your heart. Yeah, it's a, the inspiration fit is wonderful. I wish I had time to share that, but it's there in the book. You'll find it. And you can also connect with me on Facebook. I have, um, I have my personal page, but I also have an author page, Karen Asgarani. And I have a page for the hot cocoa on a rainy day stories. And um, believe it or not, I have an another page <laughs> that's oh, called Project Rare. <laughs> that's the raising awareness on the ripple effect, right? So yeah. I have three pages that you can meet me, uh, you can contact me, or even um, via email. I am on Instagram, but um, I don't use it as I should. I think it's something I need to look into. Yeah. I'm, I, I spend more time on Facebook. And email is um, Karen Asgarali, my name. Uh, all common letters, no spaces. Karen Asgarali, 810 at gmail.com. So those are the best ways to reach me. And what I'll do is I'll put your own direct links in the comments so people can just literally click on them and um, and actually actually go to them without having to type stuff in. So I'll, I'll put that in the right. comments um, at, at the end. Thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. So everyone, I hope you've enjoyed this. And of course, if you have reached a crossroads in your life and you need some help finding your meaning of life and get clear on your path, then I would love to be that guide for you. So please feel free to reach out and connect with me and we can arrange a free 20 to 30 minute video call to find out more about each other and whether or not I can actually help you on your um, journey to take charge of your destiny. And of course, please feel free to join my weekly newsletter and receive a free future life progression recording where I take you into a future lifetime so you can get guidance and clarity um, that you can use in your current life as well as a couple of other three free gifts. So everyone, thank you again so much for watching. And I'd like to invite you to share this video, as I'm sure there are more women who feel lost and want to get clear on their destiny, just like you. And of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, then please feel free to subscribe and hit the uh, bell button be notified of when the show goes live or I post new guided meditations, because every little subscribe, like, um, comment helps me. So if you can help me, that'll be brilliant. And I look forward to seeing you all same time, same place next week. So again, thank you, Karen. Thank you, everyone, everyone for watching. And I will see you next week. Bye. Bye.